Uh, you did. Well, you have an amazing crowd this morning. Thank you for coming out. We appreciate you. We love you, and we are glad you're here. Good day. God bless you. No, wait a minute. That's not right. Uh, I'll give you a disclaimer this morning. I think I should do this every week, but uh, this is just one they found on the internet. It says, all characters and events in this show are in this service. Even those based on real people are entirely fictional. All celebrity voices are impersonated poorly. <laughs> In other words, today I want to say to you, if something I say strikes a chord in you that is offensive to you, don't take it like we planned it to pick on you this morning. That's not at all. Smile and go, you know what? He's not talking about me. It's a fictional character that he's talking about. Now, differently than that, if the Holy Spirit touches your heart and says, hey, this is something you need to deal with, then you can take it to heart. How's that? All right. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Paul writes to the Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Going to read a couple of verses of Scripture. We're going to preach about an hour and 20 minutes. So just teasing. Uh, if you have it, stand for the reading of God's Word. If you don't have it, it's on the screen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is right, that is good and acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Pastor Bob, will you bless the word this morning? Amen. You can be seated. Thank you again for coming this morning. I want to break these two verses down for you. Talk just a little bit and then uh, preach, talk, do something, and share with you what God has laid on my heart this morning. It begins with Paul writing to the Romans and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. The word beseech means beg. He says, I beg you, brethren. Now, he's not talking to lost people. He's not talking to a lost and dying world. He says, brethren. That is brothers in Christ, right? He's talking to us. So today, we know that every ounce of this scripture is going to relate to us, right? Because we are the brethren. If you're not the brethren, we'll make that right before you leave here today if you choose to do so. But he writes, I beg you, brothers, that you, those that have accepted Christ by the mercies of God, Mercy is literally, there's mercy and grace that comes from God. You've heard this a million times. I'm going to throw it out one more time. Grace is unmerited favor. You didn't deserve it, but you got favor from God. Grace is salvation. Grace, salvation through grace by faith in God. That it's a, from God. And then there's mercy. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And I, I think about those things in life when, my, when I got let off the hook. You ever got let off the hook sometimes in life? Uh, you know, when you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing and, and you get caught, get, you get mercy. That's mercy. Well, everything that we do that contradicts God's word that he has not punished us for is mercy on behalf of God. So he says, I beg you, brothers, for the mercies of God, because you've gotten mercy, that you present, present means give as a gift, your bodies, that's this thing right here, the physical body, a living sacrifice, living, breathing, heart pumping, muscles moving, mind racing, sacrifice. Sacrifice is to see I in the Greek, and it means a sacrifice or a victim. So here's what he said. I beg you, brothers, because God didn't punish you the way he should have punished you, yet he gave you grace and mercy to make your bodies a living sacrifice or victim. In other words, crucify your own flesh. Not to the point of death, but to crucify your own flesh. Now, I dare say that every Christian in this room today, if I ask you the question, would you like to have your body crucified? Would you like to be holy before God? Would you literally like everything in you to line up with the way that God wants it to? Everybody in the room would say amen, right? Because we want to, but yet we everyone understand that every single day of our life, or at least for most of us, we do things in our physical body that we even regret the moment we do them. Uh, one of those, for example, would be overeating. You ever overeat? 
And they're like, man, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, my belly hurts. And I, but, but things that we do, we lust. We do many things in our body, in our physical body, that we do that we should not do. And even though we're repentant for it, nevertheless, in our physical body, we do those things. But it's not our heart to do those things. They just come naturally, believe it or not. It is part of the flesh and of nature. So Paul says, I'm begging the Christians because God didn't give you what you deserve and he gave you more than you deserved in grace and mercy that you make your bodies a present, a present unto God, a living present, a living sacrifice. So it's like, and I'm going to relate this and you can laugh if you want, it's okay. It's like God giving you a dog or a puppy. Can you relate to that, Nick? You give someone a dog or a puppy, right? So what we do is we actually take and we give God a dog or a puppy. That's our body. We're going to represent it as a puppy today. And we do it as a, this is Dave Aronson's puppy. <laughs> it's a poodle, right? This is our Christmas, I don't know what this thing is. Dalmatian, anybody ever had a Dalmatian? Worst dog on the planet. Worst dog on the planet. And then, of course, the Chihui Hui dog, the uh, Chihuahua. Body and living sacrifice unto God. Give a present. So if I gave you a present of a puppy, if I gave you a present of a puppy, you would want a dead puppy, right? You'd want a living puppy. But you also wouldn't want a puppy that peed in the carpet. Or, Nick, would you want a puppy that ate, and I quote Nick on this, an entire poop sock. An entire poop sock. And then threw it up on my living room floor. An entire sock. <laughs> How many times did you say the words an entire sock he ate? And then he threw it up. And so what you would want is you'd want a puppy that's obedient, right? You wouldn't want him dead. You'd want him alive. But you would want him to be obedient. You wouldn't want a puppy that's not obedient. So we are to present ourselves to God like we're given a gift of something that is alive and something that is precious, but it needs to be obedient. And that's what we are to be before God is obedient servants. Not because we deserve anything, but because he gave us what we didn't deserve. It says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pure, acceptable. I wonder if it means that if the body is not in submission, it's not acceptable to God. Moving on. Which is your reasonable service. Reasonable means logical service. Now I want to stop right there for just a minute and preach for just a second here. If you're in this room today and you truly know God as your Lord and Savior, you cannot logically say, you cannot logically say that God is okay with whatever you do in your life. You can't logically say that because literally what it says is a reasonable service is a logical is the word translated out. And logically speaking, I know when I do something wrong. I know because there's conviction on my heart. And let's be honest, there's morals inside of us and we understand those things. So because of that, because God, the creator of all, lives inside of us, our reasonable service, logically speaking, is to honor him with our entire body. But we don't, right? And most of uh, some of us don't. Maybe two of you don't. I don't know. But he says, make your body a living sacrifice before God. And I want to try and hurry, but I do want you to catch the picture here. Paint a word picture for you for just a moment, if I may. When you young ladies are alone with a guy, you young men are alone with a guy, and those thoughts begin with ladies. Yeah. <laughs> when you young guys are alone with a lady, thoughts run through your mind. Things begin to move in your mind. When you're looking on the internet and no one's home and you know these things that can happen, let's face it, there are many times when a desire runs through our brain. I am 19 years sober of alcohol, but if I picked up a Greek sandwich right now, a steak sandwich with onions and mushrooms and peppers in there and a little bit of Greek spice on a pita bread and a, some onion rings beside it, my mind would take me back to the ice cold beer sitting beside it. 
It happens. And I think about those things. How do I stop my body that desires something so bad? In the church of God, we used to dress girls, teenage girls in blue jeans to go swimming. Because we didn't want the guys to lust, right? A 17-year-old boy, if he thinks there's a girl walking into the room, is already excited. It doesn't matter what she looks like. It doesn't matter what she says. He's a 17-year-old boy. See, they're ducking back there because they know it's true. How do we take and put our body into submission to God? How do we take when God says for us to do something and make our body in submission to God? Because it's our flesh that we fight. We love to say the devil made me do it. Let's be real. It's our own flesh that we fight. So how do we do it? Let's read verse 2. He says, make your body a living sacrifice and be not conformed to this world. Literally, conform means to match or act like the world. Now, we have taken over time, over the years, and we have literally made the church. We want the church to be more like the world so we can draw more of the world in, right? We want to look more like the world, act more like the world. But that's not what God said. God said, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. And the word world right there, one of the words that translates for world is evermore. Ever more. So it could say, do not conform to the evermore. And if you're acting like the world, this will be your evermore. You will not have a home in heaven. You will not have an eternity in heaven. And I love it because people today literally are convinced. I know not you guys, and I literally mean that from the bottom of my heart. But today, people are convinced they can do whatever they want, and God's okay with it because He loves them and He'll look beyond it. Let me tell you something. You might love your children with all your heart, but if they take their keys and go down the side of your Cadillac, somebody's going to get whacked, aren't they? That's just the way it goes. You know why? Because that's reality. It didn't say, you know their kids, I love them, it's all right. You go, what? So he said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Transformed means to be a 180 degree turn. It means literally a 180 degree turn. To turn things completely around. To be transformed is converted, changed, or transformed. If you're a great big blue and red semi-truck, and you break out and end up as Optimus Prime, a giant robot, that's transformation, right? Yeah. That is something different than what you were. And he says, be ye there, not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do what? You just told me to keep my body in check. Now you're telling me the only way to keep my body in check is to check my mind. So what you're saying to me is, that before I'm alone in that car with that young man and the temperature begins to rise in the car, if I had my mind in check, I might not have been there in the first place. I might have known that I wasn't going to be consciously thinking. Therefore, I wouldn't go to that place. Makes sense, right? Let's see what he says about this. By the renewing, made fresh, starting over to make again. So I need to get my body as an obedient body, as a kind, loving puppy that is mindful, that doesn't eat socks. But it's reliant upon my mind. So I'm going to take you somewhere this morning. I'm going to show you a few things and then I'll shut up and let God do the rest. Here is the problem in the church today. Here's the problem in the church today. God created us to be warriors. Agreed? Agreed. Yeah. We're still living in a playground. Not you, but the church in general is still living in a playground. We'll get to this in a minute. But living in a playground, not on a battlefield, as you see up here. Battlefield, not playground. We're not living on a battleground. We're living on a playground. 
Now, what does that mean? For the drug addict, that means this. Don't go back to the drug house. Because when you think about drugs and you want drugs, if you allow that thought to continue to run around, if you allow it to climb on your monkey bars, if you allow it to get up and start playing, if you know what? If the girl down the street is making you all hot and bothered, men, stop thinking. When that thought comes into your mind, it's time to take it captive because this is Satan's playground. But God didn't make your mind a playground. He made it a battlefield. You were designed to be able to take authority over that stuff. Do you know what one of the number one things in the church today is? Is depression. Depression is taking over the church body. When we allow negative thoughts to run amok in our playground, we're allowing Satan to have a field day inside our mind. Amen. Now, it sounds simple. It's not simple. But let me say this to you very clearly. Young ladies, young men, we've been programmed to believe in security. Well, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not this enough. I'm not bad enough. And you know what that is? When you take those things, well, I was raised poorly. So therefore, it's because, and again, remember, if this applies to you, it's clearly, it's clearly coincidental. <laughs> Class dismissed. When I allow Satan to tell me I'm not good enough, all he has to do is run a thought through my brain, then it's up to me. And if I take that thought and run with it, I allow, I allow that thought to start doing this. He says, watch this. I'm going to slide down your slide. Woo! I'm going to play. I'm going to swing on your swing set. And the next thing you know, rather than saying what God said to me, guess what's happening? I'm all of a sudden meditating on what the world said. All of a sudden I'm meditating on why she didn't text me back. What's going on? I'm meditating on the problems of life. And the next thing you know, families are splitting up because they, they get so negative. They begin to meditate on all the negatives. And they're literally allowing a playground to run amok in their mind, which is Satan's control. But God said, I gave you weapons of warfare. He didn't say I gave you bar dust to play in. He said, I gave you weapons to overcome. One of Satan's favorites is this. Well, your past. Well, if I start letting the past run around in my brain, I quit preaching today. In fact, I'd have quit preaching a long time ago because here's the reality. If I let the past define me, what's the past? Two minutes ago. First service is gone. I can't change what I preached then. All I can do is be who God called me to be now. But watch this. This is what happened. And see, this is where he was speaking to Christians. And we forget this because we want to be saved. We want God to drop everything in our lap. We want Him to just deliver us and set us free from all of it. And there are times that He does that. You do that for a child when they're little, when they're on the playground running around. You change their diapers. You give them a bottle. You do whatever you have to. But as you grow up, you expect more out of that child. And God says, I'm building you and creating you and strengthening you to be a warrior. But when we allow those things, Thoughts in our mind, it becomes a playground and not a battlefield. I can't do it. If that doesn't line up with the Word of God, get it out of your mind. Put some checkpoints in place. You been to Afghanistan, JP? Nobody gets anywhere without going through a checkpoint, do they? You know why? Because it's a safety measure. The reality of this is this. We live in depression. We live in frustration. We live in anger. We live in insecurity. And it's all because we're allowing those thoughts to take a root inside of us. People tell us we're no good and we buy into that garbage. God said, He is my Father. You don't understand what the world said about me. I probably don't. But guess what? I'm not going to be in that playground. I'm going to be in this one. And if the problem comes, I'll overcome it. You know why? Because, well, you just don't understand, preacher, what I'm going through. Again, I don't. But I can tell you one thing. If I meditate on that, church, listen to me. 
I can meditate on a Sunday morning about a hundred things going on inside this building. I can meditate on a hundred things. And the next thing you know, I'm not worshiping my Savior when it says that if we worship Him, it will usher in His presence. And we know according to the Word of God that evil and sickness cannot stand in the presence of God. Therefore, what do I do? I let my mind be a playground and let Satan tear down and destroy. And then I'm not being the man of God that I'm called to be. And it's not because I'm sitting blatantly, blatantly but it's because I've allowed one thought to run a buck in my mind. People trying to quit a drug, a cigarette, whatever it is, and their mind will asphyxiate on the taste of that thing. And it'll get so bad. And they'll focus on that thing. Instead of things like, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We stand on the Word of God. This is a battlefield. We are in a war. And Satan has not pulled out the big guns because all he does is run thoughts through our head. And as long as we will follow those thoughts, he wins and we lose. Let me tell you something, young ladies. You're more than that. You're more than that. You're more than that. You're not somebody's toy. In fact, you know what I told first service to those of you that were here? Let me just tell you what I told first service. When these girls on Facebook, they go, I'm so blessed to have this young boy. I'm so blessed. He's so good. He's so good. You know what you need to be doing? You need to be saying, young man, you are blessed to be in my presence. You ought to be excited that you even get a date with me. That I even turn my eyes and look your way. You think you want to get in my pants? Let me tell you something, son. You don't have any right to be anywhere near me. The reality is, my dad is king of kings. I'm a princess. And you're even blessed to be with me. You're no good, you're no good, you're no good. You're not worthy to get a good man. You know what you ought to do, ladies? When God comes up and asks you out, you say, you know what? I'll consider it. Here's the resume. Can you fill this out? How long have you been serving God? Are you full of the Holy Ghost? Do you have a job? Because Tori's working, she's not going to support Micah forever. <laughs> she's doing more than that, baby, so that's okay. That's okay. Guys, listen to me, seriously. If we followed everything that was said in a playground, we might as well shut the doors after 45 years. Man, do we start saying, you know what? Take every everything that comes into your mind, every thought. Hmm. If that preacher will shut up, we'll go home and eat lunch. I've got chicken in the oven, beans on the stove. If that thought comes into mind and you begin to meditate on it, your stomach will begin to be hungry. And the next thing you know, you're not going to hear a thing. But if you said this, what Jesus said was this. Jesus said, you know what? Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you know what Satan did before he tempted him with the pride of life and all those things? Do you know what he did? He tried to tell Jesus, he tried to convince Jesus, put a thought in his head that he was not the Son of God. He said, if you be the Son of God, if you be the Son of God. You know what he was trying to do? He was trying to let doubt run around. He was trying to get Jesus to take the battlefield of his mind and make it a playground. How am I going to bring my body into submission? Because I'm not going to listen to what Satan says and make my mind a playground when it's a battlefield. Is it easy? No. My wife says, Sean Connery's the dude. We're older, we can say that. I know you young guys or you younger ladies think somebody else is all the stud. That's Sean Connery right there. <laughs> what happens 
we take every thought captive. So I'm just going to throw some what ifs out there. What if every time a gas bubble went through your intestines, you didn't think you were having a heart attack, or you didn't think you were having a, a, an ulcer attack or a gallbladder attack, and you didn't run to the hospital every three or four days because you had to be in the ER because you were so sick? It, it, because here's what happens. Pastor Bob shows up at my house at 10, 8, 10 o'clock at night with five pizzas, hot and ready. And you're thinking, hey, pizza, right? <laughs> and then you wake up with a bellyache. Oh, no, it's my appendix. It's on this side. No, it's a gas bubble. Stop buying into that garbage. Stop buying into that garbage. Well, my kidneys aren't functioning correctly. Well, you were outside in 100 degree weather up there listening to country music for 12 hours yesterday and you drank one bottle of water. Is it any wonder your kidneys aren't working? No, Pastor, you don't understand. Because they took us all in their head. I have a peak, but one time today, my kidneys are shutting down. Drink a little more water. They'll start working. Stop letting Satan run them up. Stop letting your mind be a playground when God didn't create us this way. Church members get up and they won't go to church because it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too something. Those are the mornings when Satan's running mess through your mind that God has a word for you. And when we allow him to run a mud, guess what? We can't accomplish because we buy the lie. We accept what the Satan runs the And let's face it. This can be so simple for children of God. Oh, okay, on time. This can be so simple for us. We let little things take over and control our lives. Worry. Absolutely. Fear. If you never, ever, ever in your life had something make you afraid that where your stomach went, whoo, Raise your hand if you've never been afraid once in your life. Guess what? Nobody in the room. What happens when we meditate on that fear is Satan wins the victory and God loses that battle. But when we take that fear and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, my stomach flopped, I'm afraid. But what does Satan say about fear? And what does God say about fear? God says in Timothy, I have not given you a spirit of fear. Ha -ha. So I know right off the bat this thing isn't from God. But I've given you a spirit of love, power, and of a sound disciplined mind. Perfect love cast out fear. Ha ha. Yeah. Guess what? If I take it off the playground and take it to the battleground, it cannot withstand. Yeah. Oh, Satan is depending on us following these little thoughts. How many of you older folks, because I know the other ones now, how many know Droopy Dog? The joy of the Lord is my strength. I will rejoice in the Lord always. It's in Thessalonians. And again, I say rejoice.